in the legal process by Judge Dale Retired. From the Great American Adventure, Secrets of America, Political History of Government and Law, important information that your bar attorney will never tell you. Forward. The following information provided by Judge Dale, a retired federal judge, is extremely important for all Americans. Since the founding of our country, the elite and their robber baron partners have fabricated our history, taken control of our economy, and altered our form of government and legal system. Judge Dale reveals ways we can best defend ourselves from the current parasitic corporate government and injustice system. As Judge Dale has exposed many times, bar attorneys have been indoctrinated as well. Their job today is to prevent people from understanding our reality and keep us locked into the legal system they were trained to implement. The current system works to their benefit and to our detriment. Confirmation of this truth can be found on www.anticorruptionsociety.com. Former World Bank attorney exposes the bankers and the bar. The government and our courts are playing chess while telling the people the game is checkers. If we the people wish to restore our unalienable birthrights, we need to learn a little chess. Al Whitney, editor, anticorruptionsociety.com. I didn't plan on writing a part five, but given the global movement in play to collapse the fiat financial dominance historically created and controlled by the Vatican, European royal and elite plus the retaliatory efforts by the United States Corporation to recoup their control of America, I felt a need to point out the flaws in their corporate process. You probably identify with the corporate process as a legal process, but it really isn't about what is legal or lawful because all process is about the enforcement of contracts or the imposition and enforcement of corporate regulations called statutes. The best advice you will ever receive is to avoid their courts whenever possible. There is no justice to be found in those courts unless you are a member of the Vatican, the royal or elite, or have purchased diplomatic immunity. The Courts The only constitutional court in America is the International Court of Trades, which was created because no foreign nation government would trade with the corporate United States until they provided a way for those foreign nations to enforce their trade agreements with America. Note, historically, the World Court was created to provide nations with a venue to enforce their trade agreements, but the corporate United States refused the court's invitation to participate because they were denied control over the court. All of the other American courts are pseudo-courts or fictions and simply are corporate administrative offices designed to resemble courts, and all of their judges are simply executive administrators designed to resemble judges. The purpose of these pseudo-corporate courts are only to settle contract disputes, and since George Washington's government was military in structure, if either party refuses to participate, these courts cannot become involved and the dispute is dead in the water. My use of the term dead in the water is not a canard because those pseudo-courts are unconstitutional courts of admiralty, the international law of the sea. The Washington Monument was completed in 1884 as a tribute to George Washington and his military government, which is actually a sea-level obelisk that infers that all of America is underwater and thus subject to the laws of admiralty as opposed or contrary to the intended constitutional civilian government under common law. The pseudo-judges of these pseudo-courts have no powers without the consent of both the plaintiff and the defendant, and in every case the judge must determine that he has consent, personum and subject matter jurisdiction, before he can act or access the Sestake Trust. Note, all tradable securities must be assigned a CUSA number before it can be offered to investors. Birth certificates and social security applications are converted into government securities, assigned a CUSA number, grouped into lots, and then are marked as a mutual fund investment. Upon maturity, the profits are moved into a government SEDICA trust, and if you are still alive, the certified documents are reinvested. It is the funds contained in these SEDICA trusts that the judge, clerk, and county prosecutor are really after or interested in. This trust actually pays all of your debts, but nobody tells you that because the elite consider those assets to be their property and the Federal Reserve System is responsible for the management of those investments. The Court Registry Investment System, also known as CRIS, the system that connects the courts to the Federal Reserve. Social Security, SSI, SSD, Medicare and Medicaid are all financed by the trust. The government makes you pay taxes 
and a portion of your wages supposedly to pay for these services, which they can borrow at any time for any reason, since they cannot access the SESTA-K Trust to finance their wars or to bail out Wall Street and their patron corporations. The public is encouraged to purchase all kinds of insurance protection when the trust actually pays for all physical damages, medical costs, new technology, and death benefits. The hype to purchase insurance is a ploy to keep us in poverty and profit off our stupidity because the Vatican owns a controlling interest in all insurance companies. You may receive a monthly statement from a mortgage company, loan company, or utility company, which usually has already been paid by the trust. Almost all of these corporate businesses double dip and hope that you've been conditioned well enough by their credit scams to pay them a second time. Instead of paying that statement next time, sign it approved and mail it back to them. If they then contact you about payment, ask them to send you a true bill instead of a statement and you'll be glad to pay it. A statement documents what was due and paid, whereas a true bill represents only what is due. Banks and utility companies have direct access into these SESTA-K trusts, and all they needed was your name, social security number, and signature. Criminal Law There are no criminal laws in America because criminal laws would imply that the corporate United States government are sovereign that have absolute power over all living, flesh-and-blood Americans, which of course is not true because the corporation is a fiction and therefore cannot be sovereign. Man is sovereign and is in control of his own destiny, and one day he will finally wake up and realize this to be true. This is, however, criminal contracts being enforced against us and with our consent, which are surreptitiously called criminal statutes. Our consent has been obtained by them vice a vi our silence and failure to act or protest, which under law is defined as tacit procreation. In other words, tacit procreation. If someone accuses you of theft in writing and you fail to respond or deny those allegations in writing, your failure to deny or act is considered an admission of guilt, or you receive a bill for goods or services that you never ordered or received and you fail to deny those allegations. Your omission represents the truth of the matter, which imposes an obligation to pay. Collection companies frequently use tacit procreation to establish indebtedness to them on a discharged debt they had purchased from some corporate business. Now you're probably thinking, no criminal laws? Well, that can't be true. A whole lot of people have been tried, convicted, and are doing time in American jails for breaking criminal laws. And my response to that is, true. They are in jail because they unknowingly accepted the criminal contract on behalf of their birth certificate and consented to be in prison as a condition of their conviction and punishment. Their lawyer didn't help any because he reinforced that situation buying through his notice of appearance to represent you. It is the birth certificate that is under arrest, which I will explain shortly. Note, criminal contracts are graded according to the severity of the crime alleged and that grading is identified as either summary, misdemeanor, felony, or capital offenses. The criminal process usually begins with a police officer issuing a citation or making an arrest with or without a warrant or the police officer or county attorney prepares a complaint based upon a sworn affidavit or an information which is presented to a judge and a warrant is then issued. The defendant is subsequently arrested and is brought before a judge for arraignment. The complaint and warrant will reflect your birth name or identify you as a John Doe if your name is unknown which is typed out in all capital letters. This is not a mistake on their part because it is your birth certificate that is under arrest and not your living flesh and blood person. The hope of these pseudo courts is that the flesh and blood person will be intimidated enough to accept responsibility for the birth certificate. Sounds crazy, but nothing is what it seems. It's all smoke and mirrors. Most police officers do not know or have these details and believe in what they are doing and believe the lawyers who counsel them in law like they are gods. Big mistake on their part, because just like everyone else, they too have been vigorously lied to. You can't trust lawyers to be inherently honest. Police officers are instructed to always print or type the defendant's name in capital letters, but they are never told the reason why. As a precaution, you should always carry a copy of your birth certificate with you as part of your identification papers, which I will explain in the next paragraph. At your arraignment or trial, the judge will ask you if you are the named individual, all caps, birth name, on the complaint, and your natural response will be to answer in the affirmative, but that is exactly what you don't want to do. 
Remove your birth certificate and respond to him by stating, I'm making a special limited appearance on behalf of the defendant who is right here and hold up your birth certificate. Then state the following. As I understand this process, Judge, the county attorney or police officer has leveled a criminal charge with the clerk and against the trust, using the all caps name that appears on this birth certificate. The use of capital letters dictated by the U.S. printing style manual, which explains how to identify a corporation. The clerk, who is the administrator of the Seste K Trust, then appointed you, Judge, as the trustee for the trust, and since neither of you can be the beneficiary, that leaves me, and therefore you, are my trustee. So as my trustee, I instruct you to discharge this entire matter with prejudice and award the penalties for these crimes to be paid to me in compensation and damages for my false arrest. Note, the law of trust dictates that an administrator, trustee, and beneficiary cannot serve two positions in a trust, so a trustee cannot be a beneficiary too. The trustee judge has no alternative but to honor your demands, but you have to get this right and act with confidence. You really need to know this information well, so that you cannot be hoodwinked or confused by either of them. They will or may attempt to play some mind games with you if you display any doubt, stammer, or display a lack of confidence. Appearances, the pomp and majesty, of these pseudo-courts is totally for your benefit and is intended to invoke fear and intimidation. If you show fear or intimidation, you get a pony ride. Note, I've seen and heard of judges and prosecutors interfering with the defendant's response, which made the defendant become confused, and he was subsequently committed into a mental hospital for a psychiatric evaluation. The judge and the prosecutor successfully twisted what the defendant was trying to say, and then the judge ordered a mental evaluation. Understand that the county attorney will be forced to pay the cost of court out of his own pocket if the case is discharged, so he isn't going to give up that easily. And the judge, clerk, and county attorney stand to make a pretty penny off of your conviction and incarceration, so don't screw it up. I took the time to research this and find out whether or not the prosecutor is liable for the cost in a criminal proceeding if he abandons the case. I found in Georgia, in my state, under OCGA 1711-4, imposition of costs and jail fees upon prosecutor or complainant. Under A, Section 3, it states, the prosecution is abandoned before trial. When it is thus abandoned, the officer who issued the warrant shall enter a judgment against the prosecutor for all the costs and enforce it by an execution in the name of the state or by an attachment for contempt. And I researched the definition of attachment for contempt, and it is a warrant for an arrest. The arrest of a person who is either in contempt of court or is to be held as security for the payment of a judgment. Cases Execution 421 Corpus Juris Secundi Execution Subsection 24 Hmm, looks like Judge Dale was on point with this one. Public Defender If there is a court involved, the judge may appoint a public defender for the defendant. You are not the defendant. The straw man named on the presentment was chosen to be the defendant. Remember rule number one, the public and private can never be mixed. They can't do it, and you can't do it. They don't ever mix them, so be careful you don't either. If the defendant has a public defender, this is good. When the prosecutor signs a complaint, verifying it, and his signature is notarized, he's taking on the liability that may follow in the event it is discovered the complaint is not valid. He has taken a chance, because at that point, he is the only attorney of record. He has filed a form of notice of appearance by filing the complaint or filing the grand jury indictment.
He technically represents the defendant until someone takes his place. He is counting on someone appearing in the case to defend against his complaint. If that doesn't happen, he is the responsible party and liable for all the cost prayed for in the complaint or associated with the statute violation. If that does happen, he is off the hook. Almost 100% of the time, that is what happens. He's pretty safe taking this chance. Usually, the straw man named on the complaint gets a good attorney to defend him. That means the defense attorney has taken on the liability, right? Not so fast. He does not take on the liability until he signs a notice of appearance and files it in the clerk file for that case. Once he is the attorney of record for the defense, he's on the hook. Now, he has to get someone to take his place. The likely taker on that position is the straw man named in the complaint, indictment, or traffic ticket. The straw man can't talk, so someone has to represent it. Usually, that is you, because you have a point to make, or a lesson to teach, or testimony that will prove your case. Wrong choice. This is almost always the losing proposition. Really good off-point paperwork has been put into court for decades with very low success rate. The only way to win is to let the state win. I love win-win situations. How can you win and the state win at the same time? If you accept and return the presentment and exchange your exemption for discharge of the charges, the state gets the credits from your exemption and you get the discharge when you bond the case. Well, that sounds easy, right? If the defense attorney can get you to act as the trustee for the straw man trust named on the complaint, the defense attorney is off the hook too. It is just a series of passing the buck, a hot potato game. The one who ends up with it has to pay the bill. The prosecuting attorney starts with it. It goes on to the defense attorney if he files a notice of appearance and then on to the straw man if he volunteered to defend, argue, testify, or join in the action in any way. It eventually ends up in your lap. You are stuck with the public liability unless you accept and discharge it from the private side. The hot potato game. Prosecuting attorney, defense attorney, straw man, and you. If there is no defense attorney, it just passes to the defending straw man. If you accept, it stays with the prosecuting attorney. He has the power to settle the accounting if you authorize him to do so. If the county attorney begins to act too cocky with you, you can take the wind out of his sails by asking him to produce the 1040 for this case. If he denies the need to do such a thing, Inform him that you will be taking care of that for him ASAP, as soon as possible. He may move for a discharge at that point because you are a little too dangerous or smart. The last thing that that prosecutor wants is the IRS examining his files for the last seven years because he makes money on every conviction, but he doesn't pay taxes on them as a rule. He usually only declares the salary he receives. Also, should you accidentally find yourself in a mental hospital, the psychiatrist who is assigned or appointed to evaluate you is just as corrupt as the judge, clerk and county attorney, and he will falsify all your responses to him, just so that you are recommitted back into the mental facility with a review in six months. So lie to him and deny that you ever made such remarks. Of course, if you accept the criminal charges against your birth certificate, then you will instantly be deemed sane. Sorry that I had to be the one to tell you this, but this is how corrupt many of my fellow judges truly are, and it should explain why my conscience caused me to retire early. Before I learned what was really going on, I believed that my duties and performance were entirely constitutional. I was lied to also. Citations The citation process can be handled much easier through the mail. When a police officer issues you a citation, he's actually requesting you to contract with him. He is alleging that you violated a corporate regulation in writing, which you have accepted by signing and thus requires you to respond. The police officer is instructed to explain that your signature is merely an acknowledgement that you received a copy of the citation, but in actuality, your signature is notification to the court and judge that you have accepted or consented to this offer to contract, which also grants the judge consent, personum, and subject matter jurisdiction over you and the case. You can cancel that contract, however, by rescinding your consent. 
The Federal Truth in Lending Act provides that any party to a contract may rescind his contract within three business days of entering into such a contract. So across the face of the citation, you should print or type in large print the following words. I do not accept this offer to contract, and I do not consent to these proceedings. Use blue ink for admiralty or purple ink for royalty. Admiralty is the court and royalty represents your sovereignty. Either way is appropriate. Sign your signature underneath in blue or purple ink and in front of a notary and under your signature type, without prejudice, UCC 1-308. This is another way to declare that you may not be held responsible for this contract pursuant to the Uniform Commercial Code. Serve the council citation back on the clerk slash court, along with a certificate of service by certified mail, return receipt requested. This kills the citation, removes your consent, and removes the jurisdiction of the court. All at the same time. It really is that simple. Note, a certificate of service is a letter that first identifies the citation and then defines how and when you return the document to the court and is signed. If not denied, it becomes a truth in commerce by tacit procreation. Remember to keep a copy of everything in case the clerk attempts to trash your response, which certainly will not happen with a certificate of service or if it is mailed back by the notary. The notary is actually a deputy secretary of state and is more powerful than the court clerk. Public notaries originate from the time of the Egyptian and Roman scribes who were the purveyors of certified documents, which are sworn affidavits. Certified documents and sworn affidavits are truth in commerce. In other words, birth certificates are certified documents on bond paper. The word bonded is derived from bondage and slavery, which makes all of us bond slaves to whoever retains custody of our original birth certificates. I bet you believe that the Emancipation Proclamation freed the slaves, and it did for a short time, and then the birth certificate and the 14th Amendment enslaved us all. Summons and Lawsuits The summons process, whether it is defined a civil or criminal action, is once again an offer to contract, despite what words are used to command your appearance or response. It too can be canceled just by following the same procedure as the citation process above. A million dollar lawsuit is no different than a citation, and both can be canceled. Hard to believe, isn't it? Does your lawyer know about this? You bet he does, but he is not permitted to embarrass the court, and besides, court is where he makes his money. Note, how many of you have ever attempted to avoid jury duty? All you had to do was cancel the summons, offer the contract, notarize it, and mail it back to the jury commissioner. Don't worry. They won't bother you because you are obviously too smart and may influence their jury. The jury controls the court and not the prosecutor and judge, and if you know that, they lose and the defendant wins, which is why they prefer only the dumbed-down candidates to serve on a jury. There are a few matters or issues that are next to impossible to circumvent or quash because of the depth of corruption within these pseudo-courts, such as child custody and the division of property resulting from a divorce. The birth state claims the custody of your children pursuant to the birth certificate and records them under the Department of Transportation as a state-owned vessel. A marriage is a contract and all that is required is a prenuptial agreement to complete the marriage. But if you are sufficiently indoctrinated to believe that a judge or mayor or a minister or priest must join you in holy matrimony and you subsequently apply for a license, now you both have married the state as well. Now the state is entitled to its fair share of the division of your marital property should the marriage not work out or should you die, called probate. Some people might say that a divorce should be included on this list of impossible issues, but then they don't know what I know. Marriage Licenses, The Real Truth by Virgil Cooper Enlightening Conversation with a Marriage License Bureau About 15 years ago, my former wife of 26 years filed for divorce. We had seven children, five daughters, and two sons. Our youngest at the time, our second son, was five years old. At the time, I prepared a counterclaim to petition for dissolution her attorney filed in domestic relations court. I met one afternoon with the head of the Maricopa County Superior Court Marriage License Bureau in downtown Phoenix. The Marriage License Bureau was headed by a young woman of about age 25. 
asked her to explain to me the general and statutory implications of the marriage license. She was very cooperative and called in an assistant, a tall black man who at the time was working on as operations manual for internal departmental use. She deferred for most technical explanations to her assistant. He walked through the technicalities of the marriage license as it operates in Arizona. He mentioned that marriage licensing is pretty much the same in the other states, but there are differences. One significant difference he mentioned was that Arizona is one of eight western states that are community property states. The other states are common law states, including Utah, with the exception of Louisiana, which is a Napoleonic Code state. He then explained some of the technicalities of the marriage license. He said, first of all, the marriage license is a secular contract between the parties and the state. The state is the principal party in the secular contract. The husband and wife are secondary or inferior parties. The secular contract is a three-way contract between the state as principal and the husband and wife as the other two legs of the contract. He said, in the traditional sense, a marriage is a covenant between the husband and wife and God. But in the secular contract with the state, reference to God is a dotted line and not officially considered included in the secular contract at all. He said if the husband and wife wish to include God as a party in their marriage, that is a dotted line they will have to add in their own minds. The state marriage license is strictly secular, he said. He said further that what he meant by the relationship to God being a dotted line meant that the state regards any mention of God as irrelevant, even meaningless. In his description of the marriage license contract, the related one of the dotted line, he said in the traditional religious context, marriage was a covenant between the husband and wife and God with husband and wife joined as one. This is not the case in the secular realm of the state's marriage license contract. The state is the principal or dominant party. The husband and wife are merely contractually joined as business partners, not in any religious union. They may even be considered, he said, connected to each other by another dotted line. The picture he was trying to paint was that of a triangle with the state at the top and a solid line extending from the apex. The state down the left side to the husband and the separate solid line extending down to the right side to the wife. A dotted line merely showing that they considered themselves to have entered into a religious union of some sort that is irrelevant to the state. He further mentioned that this religious overtone is recognized by the state by requiring that the marriage must be solemnized either by a state official or by a minister of religion that has been deputized by the state to perform the marriage ceremony and make a return of the signed and executed marriage license to the state. Again, he emphasized that marriage is a strictly secular relationship so far as the state is concerned and because it is looked upon as a privileged business enterprise various tax advantages and other political privileges have become attached to the marriage license contract that have nothing at all to do with marriage as a religious covenant or bond between God and a man and a woman by way of reference if you would like to read a legal treatise on marriage one of the best is Principles of Community Property by William Defeniak. At the outset, he explains that community property law descends from Roman civil law through the Spanish Codes, 600 A.D., written by the Spanish Jurist Consults. In the civil law, the marriage is considered to be a for-profit venture or profit-making venture, even though it may never actually produce a profit in operation. And as the wife goes out to the local market to purchase foodstuffs and other supplies for the marriage household, she is replenishing the stocks of the business. To restate, in the civil law, the marriage is considered to be a business venture, that is, a for-profit business venture. Moreover, as children come into the marriage household, the business venture is considered to have born fruit. Now, Back to the explanation by the Maricopa County Superior Court, Marriage Bureau Administrative Assistant. He went on to explain that every contract must have consideration. The state offers consideration in the form of the actual license itself, the piece of paper, the certificate of marriage. The other part of consideration by the state is the privilege to be regulated by statute. He added that this privilege to be regulated by statute includes all related statutes, and all court cases as they are ruled on by the courts, and all statutes and regulations into the future in the years following the commencement of the marriage. 
He said, in a way, the marriage license contract is a dynamic or flexible, ever-changing contract as time goes along, even though the husband and wife didn't realize that. My thought on this is, can it really be considered a true contract as one becomes aware of the failure by the state to make full disclosure of the terms and conditions? A contract must be entered into knowingly, intelligently, intentionally, and with fully informed consent. Otherwise, technically, there is no contract. Another way to look at the marriage license contract with the state is a contract of adhesion, a contract between two disparate, unequal parties. Again, a flawed contract. Such a contract with the state is said to be a specific performance contract as to the privileges, duties, and responsibilities that attach. Consideration on the part of the husband and wife is the actual fee paid and the implied agreement to be subject to the state statutes, rules, and regulations, and all court cases ruled on related to marriage law, family law, children, and property. He emphasized that this contractual consideration by the bride and groom places them in a definite and defined by law position, inferior and subject to the state. He commented that very few people realize this. He also said that it is very important to understand that children born to the marriage are considered by law as the contract bearing fruit, meaning the children primarily belong to the state, even though the law never comes out and says so in so many words. In this regard, children born to the contract regarded as the contract bearing fruit. He said it is vitally important for parents to understand two doctrines that become established in the United States during the 1930s. The first is the doctrine of parent patria. The second is the doctrine of in loco parentis. Parents patria means literally the parent of the country, or stated more bluntly, the state is the undisclosed true parent. Along this line, a 1930s Arizona Supreme Court case states that parents have no property right in their children and have custody of their children during good behavior at the sufferance of the state. This means that parents may raise their children and maintain custody of their children as long as they don't offend the state. But if they in some manner displease the state, the state can step in at any time and exercise its superior status and take custody and control of its children. The parents are only conditional caretakers, thus the doctrine of in loco parentis. He also added a few more technical details. The marriage license is an ongoing contractual relationship with the state. Technically, the marriage license is a business license allowing the husband and wife, in the name of the marriage, to enter into contracts with third parties and contract mortgages and debts. They can get car loans, home mortgages, and installment debt in the name of the marriage because it's not only a secular enterprise, but is looked upon by the state as a privileged business enterprise as well as a for-profit business enterprise. The marriage contract acquires property throughout its existence and over time. It is hoped increases in value. Also, the marriage contract bears fruit by adding children. If sometime later the marriage fails and a divorce results, the contract continues in existence. The divorce is merely a contractual dissolution or amendment of the terms and conditions of the contract. Jurisdiction of the state over the marriage, over the husband and wife, now separated, continues and continues over all aspects of the marriage, over marital property, and over children brought into the marriage. That is why family law and the domestic relations court calls divorce a dissolution of the marriage because the contract continues in operation but in amended or modified form. He also pointed out that the marriage license contract is one of the strongest, most binding contractual relationship the state has on people. At the end of our hour-long meeting, I somewhat humorously asked if other people had come in and asked the question I was asking. The assistant replied that in the several years he had worked there, he was not aware of anyone else asking these questions. He added that he was very glad to see someone interested in the legal implications of the marriage license and the contractual relationship it creates with the state. His boss, the young woman, marriage bureau department head, stated, You have to understand that people who come in here to get a marriage license are in heat. The last thing they want to know is technical, legal, and statutory implications of the marriage license. I hope this is helpful information to anyone interested in getting more familiar with the contractual implications of the marriage license. The marriage license as we know it didn't come into existence until after the Civil War and didn't become standard practice in all the states until after 1900, becoming firmly established by 1920. In effect, 
the states or governments appropriated or usurped control of marriage in secular form and in the process declared common law applicable to marriages abrogated. Please pass this information along and share it as widely as possible. Divorce An action in divorce is a request to break the licensed marriage contract. If you desire a divorce and your spouse refuses to consent to a divorce, no state judge will grant you a divorce decree because the judge has not been granted the consent of both parties. There is a way around this, however, which your lawyer will never admit to because he cannot make any money from giving you truthful or sound advice. Note, Puerto Rico is the United States territory acquired from Spain, and it still operates under Spanish law. This was never changed for the corporate United States when Puerto Rico became a U.S. territory. So first you need to fly to Puerto Rico. Once in Puerto Rico, you can establish residency by simply opening a post office box for a period of three days. Just after opening the post office box, hire a local paralegal to prepare an action to divorce for you. The paralegal will file the divorce petition immediately, which is generally a certified form document and will be heard by a Puerto Rican judge within three days. Under Spanish law, your spouse is not required to be served the divorce petition, only the divorce decree. Five days after the decree, your former spouse will receive the divorce decree in the mail, written entirely in Spanish, which cannot be contested and must be honored by all U.S. federal and state courts. Note, immediately after the Puerto Rican judge declares you divorced, if you choose, you can marry again by contract or by license. Both are legitimate, but no one will ever tell you that. The division of marital property and custody of children is a much more complicated issue, but at least the divorce cannot be utilized as leverage against you to divide up your property, less than proportionately, which is exactly why American judges will not bifurcate the issue involved in the divorce. In other words, divorce, division of property, custody, support, and alimony. The hope is that your desire to obtain a divorce is worth more to you than anything else you own, now or in the future. Foreclosure. If you're involved in a foreclosure or you're thinking about filing for bankruptcy protection to buy you more time, instead of trying to defeat the corrupt bank and your creditors in a state or federal court where the cards are certainly stacked against you, plan to file for bankruptcy and do it this way to ensure that you come out on top. All bankruptcy forms are printable, can be obtained online, and they can be completed in longhand with an ink pen. The forms to use are B1 through B8. You only need to prepare and file the first five or six pages to obtain a case number, and then you must sit through a credit counseling session, which can be done all in a day. When you're completely finished with preparing your petition, you should have filed about 58 pages in total, and the filing fee is around $280. Here's the reason for using the bankruptcy courts. List all of your debts on one schedule, and when it comes to listing your assets, include your birth certificate and its QCIP number. The value of the mutual fund investment for your birth certificate can also be found online using the QCIP number under Fidelity Investments. You will discover that it is worth multi-millions, but you must have the QCIP number on your asset schedule or the birth certificate will be discharged as frivolous by the judge or the trustee. The bankruptcy judge will then appoint a lawyer trustee to dissolve the mutual fund investment, pay off your debts, and the balance must be paid to you. This procedure usually attracts the attention of the DOJ, Department of Justice, because they don't want the lawyer trustee to screw up and shortchange the Vatican, the Federal Reserve, and the corporate United States, and so they tend to warn or threaten the lawyer trustee to be very careful. Most of these mutual fund investments usually involve a group of between 10 and 25 birth certificates, and so only a fraction of that mutual fund belongs to you. The bankruptcy judge will not certify the final disposition until the lawyer trustee can prove his math and every aspect of his work because the judge inherits responsibility for the trustee's errors, if he made any. After the lawyer trustee resigns, you can probably cut a deal with the Department of Justice, or you can proceed on with the same bankruptcy proceeding and the newly appointed lawyer trustee. Now, isn't that easier and better than attacking or defending yourself against the bank and a bunch of greedy creditors, knowing full well that the cards are stacked against you because of the Vatican and the Federal Reserve System? While you're in bankruptcy, you are protected. No one can proceed against you for any debts or foreclosure as long as you have a bond or sufficient assets. The birth certificate guarantees that aspect, and while in bankruptcy, you won't have to pay on any of those debts.
Your debts will eventually be discharged, and the balance of the trust fund is to go into your pocket. It's a win-win situation any way you shake it, and the Vatican, government, and bank lose the trust fund assets they plan to steal from you all along. Note, there is a process to follow to determine your CUSA number, or you can ask a stockbroker friend to help you, or hire a broker on the side to assist you. There are people in the Patriot Movement who also know how to apply the formula, which converts your birth registration number and or social security number into a CUSA number. I paid to have mine done and discovered that I am worth about $167 million. It's all fiat money, but as long as it can be spent, who cares? I hope that this entire expose has enlightened and elevated your personal knowledge and will benefit you now and in the future. Peace be unto you.